We thank God for those who are on Facebook, those who are on YouTube, those who watch, who have moved forward in their lives into a place where they can have financial, uh, financial blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. We're continuing on in our sermon series called Mind Games. Mind Games. Somebody say Mind Games. Mind Games. Mind Games. Okay, there you go. We need some coffee. We have coffee in the back. Head Games. Okay, that's okay. I'm sorry about that. Head Games. I make stuff up when I'm tired. But that's okay. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 13 in a few moments, but I do want to have a quick recap of what it is that we've gone over so that you can see the flow of what we're teaching and the and the crux of what we're teaching. We initially started by talking about David and Solomon and others who knew God, but they did not know themselves. Remember, they recognized and they knew about God, but what happened was they miscalculated their relationship with God and what God would do for them. They didn't recognize God probably would have done more if they were obedient. But they didn't recognize their appetites. They didn't recognize the things that they have, uh, they they that they would experience and how it would start to come, and it would start to bring them into a direction in a place where it wasn't good. Last week we spoke about the widow. We talked. We spoke about the widow that had. Uh, because she, her husband had passed away unexpectedly. It was something that happened. They weren't forced, they, they, they couldn't foresee what was about to happen. And he passed away and though he had an anointing, and though he was able to see the vision in the future and preach the word of God, he did not have wisdom. So what ended up start what ended up happening is he got into debt. And he couldn't foresee his own death. So as a result of that, they ended up in a bad place. And his wife had to go to Elisha. And his wife asked Elisha, you know, he was a good man. What can you do for us? And Elisha did something unique. Elisha asked, what do you have in your house? And she answered, nothing. Quick answer, nothing. See, so many of some of us don't have an idea what we have in our giftings in our house. We don't have an idea of the giftings we have within us until somebody draws it out, until a circumstance draws it out. We don't recognize many times our giftings. You don't know what you can do until a circumstance arises that, that, that a certain skill is needed. And you never knew you had it within you. She had no idea what was in her heart and in her life. You see, so sometimes we don't recognize what's in us. We can believe God, but God says, I want to bring all thoughts captivity to Christ Jesus. It's something that we have to do. Because no matter what, a portion of us, a portion of the flesh is going to be alive. And the flesh is always going to be at enmity. That means at odds. That means the flesh is always going to go against what God wants. The flesh is always going to go where it wants. The flesh is something that's unincorrigible. It cannot be changed. Yeah, there's only one place for it to go, death. Now we're in part three of head games and the title of our message today is a lot lost a lot lost we talked about that you were here thursday night we told i told you the passage scripture we're going to be preaching from i wanted you to study it for the purpose of being able to come to certain conclusions and write things down and we can talk about this in the near future where we can have a round table and sit down and talk about how God speaks to us and how God's using us and how God is ministering in and through our lives. Amen? Let's turn to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13 and we're going to be reading from verse 5 to verse 9. The scripture says this, Now 
Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have an equality between you and me, between your herdsmen or mine. For we're close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We ask in the precious name of Jesus that you prepare our hearts, you prepare our minds, that you would renew our minds, Lord God, according to your will and purpose and good pleasure, that you would cultivate our hearts, Lord God, to be able to grow and to become strong in the might of your spirit. Lord, we open ourselves up to you, Holy Spirit, Come in, have, a, have your way in our lives. Take out areas and sharpen areas and remove areas of our lives that will come between us as we continue to endeavor to come closer to you, to draw close to you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, if you think about life in, in the Christian circles, there are three ways that you can live. You can live in a manner that's secular, that's worldly. That means that you come, you might come to church every once in a while, a CEO, Christian and Easter, Christmas and Easter only, Christian, that just comes in just to just to sort of check in and say, okay, I did that now. My mind is clear, and I can go about doing whatever I want. That casual person or that, that individual that's out in the world. You can also be a church person. What's the difference? A church person to Christians is a good thing, right? No, not necessarily. Being in church does not mean that you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Being in church does not mean that your character is going to change. Being in church does not make you a good person. Being in church doesn't change you into a Christian as much as going to McDonald's change you into being a hamburger. It doesn't do it. I know, I heard the huh? So there's a, there, there's a Christian that goes, there's a person that goes to church. But then the third type of person you could be and choose, and this is a choice by the way. The third type of person you could be is a person who walks in the spirit. Who has Jesus not as just Savior but as Lord. Who comes and says, Lord, what shall I do? It's the person that's seeking first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And everything else he doesn't worry about. There's a person that, that, that's shunned by society because they're different. Because they don't walk in the same manner as everyone else on the outside. So you could be any, you could be one of those three types of people in this place today, or even watching today. And there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But let me say this to you. If you are sick of sinking, if you are tired of just surviving, and if you're ready to thrive, it's time to walk the king's way. It's time to walk according to the spirit. Because in the world, you could be sinking. And you could be tired of sinking. You could be tired of experiencing the same things over again. 
I don't know who said it, but it was a great statement. Insanity is doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. You can be tired of surviving because in church you can just survive. And you come to church just to be able to survive. Or you can thrive. The distinction is in the manner in which you walk. And let me tell you about the king's way. Let's talk about the way by which you're walking in the spirit. If you're walking the king's way, it is different and distinct from the culture's way. Because the culture's way walks in the world. It walks according to what's acceptable in the world. It won't ruffle feathers. But then again, when feathers aren't ruffled, there's no growth. In the culture, the way up is up. You have to claw up if you want to be standard concerning the culture. But if you live the king's way, the way up is down. See, Jesus said that the, that the Son of Man has not come to be served. He deserves to be served. But Mark 10.45 says that he did not come to be served, but he came to serve. The way up is down. If I humble myself, God will exalt me in due season. Is anybody due for a season of exaltation? Is anybody due for a season where you can be lifted up and where, where you don't have to walk according to the dolphins? Are you ready to thrive? Are you ready to walk in victory like we, like we sung today? If you're living like the culture's way, you take what you get. If you're living like the king's way, you give to get. It's different. Because when you pour out, God will pour in. When you give, when you, when you give, especially out of your need. And I'm not saying, hey, give, give the church your money for uh, rent and be homeless. No, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is an attitude, a lifestyle of giving. It's not just in a building two hours a week. It's living out there. It's walking out there. It's being visible out there. To be a blessing to others and God will pour into you joy. That's why it's, the words were said. It's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. Running over shall men give unto your bosom. Well, and women too. And mothers. Amen? In culture, you have to gain to gain. You have to continue to scratch and claw to gain. But you, when you live the king's way, you lose to gain. Do you remember what we talked about on Thursday? Every, and the principle is this, and when we're looking at Acts chapter 8, we'll be looking at Acts chapter 9 next week, Lord Wills, on Thursday. But in Acts chapter 8, in order, whenever something dies for the kingdom of heaven's sake, our God that we serve is the God of resurrection. And because he's the God of resurrection, whatever we offer to him gets risen up again. How do you know that, Pastor Chris? Give me a scripture. Romans chapter 12, chapter 12, or Romans, in fact, even better, Romans chapter 8. Offer yourselves a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Offer yourselves. Because there's no condemnation for those who are Christ. Amen? The Bible says he who wants to save his life must be willing to lose his life. Because the one who loses his life saves his life. See, when you're living the king's way, there are times that your addition will come through subtraction. All this is to say that there are times when you think you're going through loss. You think you're going through something that you cannot make it through. You're going through something that's heart-wrenching. You're going through something that's hard. You're going through something that's jerking tears from your eyes. And you think it's over because there's no other way. But God is saying to you, when one door closes, another door is going to open. 
and sometimes to get you lose There is a reconciliation for losses in our lives. Maybe it's not your season for multiplication. Because sometimes you go to a church and you hear everybody's always prospering, always seems to be blessed, but where's mine? See, the fact of the matter is you don't know whether you're getting blessed or not. Sometimes you think, I'm, I'm not going through a good time, I'm not going through a good season in my life. But ultimately, the season that you're going through right now is preparing you for a next season. It's preparing you for a, for a resurrection. It's preparing you for a buoyancy that you need to have in your life where you're able to bounce back no matter what comes and hits you. So when you're living the king's way, your addition could sometimes come through subtraction. And if you're aware of how God does things, in these seasons, and this is the hardest thing, believe me, I'm learning it, right? I was very transparent on Thursday. I'm learning it. We're learning it all together. It doesn't make a difference. 20, 30 years, 40 years. Paul took 30 years and he said, I still can't attain it. But even throughout the years and everything like that, we're continually learning That you shouldn't have a pity party when something happens. Instead, you should have a praise party. Because over the years, in 30 years plus, that I've been serving God by the grace of God, and Louise even more, we need to tell you, we, somebody needs to know in this place, or even at home today, that there's some stuff that because you know when God takes, He's ready to give. He's always ready to give. And I don't know what needs to be subtracted from your life. But I want to tell somebody here that God will never take something from you that you need. He may, ne he may take something from us that we want. He may take something from us that we learn to become accustomed to lean on. He may take something away that we start to depend on or things that we might even want to keep for keep's sake. But my God, if He takes it from you, it means that He's getting ready to replace it with Himself. See, even if he doesn't replace you with anything else, he says, I'm going to step in. I'm going to show my people that I still got you. See, I'm going to be a lawyer in the courtroom for you. I'm going to be a doctor in the sick room for you. And I'm going to be a bridge over troubled waters for you. Where's that in the Bible? Isaiah chapter 40. 43, excuse me. And, and some addition from time to time comes through subtraction. Through things that we have to walk away from. Things that sometimes we want. Hallelujah. But I need to identify something extremely important. That some of us may need to be subtracted or have subtraction of someone in our lives. There are some relationships that could be poisonous and asinine to your walk. I'm not saying this in light of circumstances that are happening in certain people's lives. Please do not think that way. That is not happening right now. What you go, what certain people are going through is difficult but it's a season of having to continue to walk and allowing pieces to land and allow God to put things together the right way. Amen? So I'm not talking about a particular circumstance. I'm talking about all of us. 
There are people that we go around that we need to be around or we think we need to be around that go and drag us down, that drag us back to the places where we were. They drag us back into alcohol and drugs. They drag us back into hurtful, hateful places. They drag us back into places of prejudice and separatism. They drag us back into places where we start to swerve away from the kingdom and the will and purpose of God. For some of us, there's something we need to lose. Some of us need to lose a lot. Because some of your headaches are coming from humans. Our foundational text in Genesis gives us some insight into this issue. This text allows us to be exposed to an experience between a man named Lot and his nephew, uh, a man named Abram, excuse me, and his nephew whose name is Lot. And there is a number of angles that we can take to explore the richness of this account. But for the purpose of this message, I want to risk oversimplifying the reality in this passage. The question is, who is Lot? I was talking to uh, I was talking to my coworker Daniel, and we were talking about this message as I was preparing. And I was asking him, who, who would you say Lot is? Because he's a very he's a seasoned believer, but he's young. Amen. Because Lot is always a lot. Someone, you know, someone. Name lot could be costing you a lot. And it's only when we deal with lot that we can address the lot that we're losing. I hope this makes sense to you. I hope you can understand this. So the question is, who is lot? How can we identify who lot is? I mean, we, we read about it before and even after this paragraph that we talked about. But I want to say this, Lot represents someone that you have affection for, that you are not responsible for, that you need to make adjustments with. I'm going to say that again for the sake of our note taker. I should say this because there's two. <laughs> Lot represents someone that you have affection for that you are not responsible for, that you need to make adjustments with. And some of the issues and problems and headaches that we have in our lives are lingering because there are some adjustments that just haven't been made. They haven't been made. And if we're willing to make some adjustments, we can get some relief. I'm proclaiming this message today because someone needs to discern and recognize it's the season to make adjustments. That some things don't change until things change. Some things don't move until certain things in our lives move. And many of us are waiting helplessly, helplessly waiting on someone else for a revelation of what's best, our best in our interest. We're waiting for a direction to go in. And we're waiting on them to get a revelation that they need to make an adjustment so that they can help us. See, the problem is, when not, many times we don't realize that God's given us a responsibility for ourselves. And that's not to say or to be or to cultivate selfishness. But there has to be a responsibility that we take upon ourselves for ourselves. And then from the overflow and from the ministry and from the directive of God, we're able to bless 
others. And the problem is, none of us can keep waiting on others to keep making an adjustment to bless us. I need to make an, a, an adjustment to bless myself. And if anybody loves you, and listen to me carefully on this, if anybody loves you, they will make their adjustments along with you. If somebody loves you, they will make an adjustment with you. All right? Because if you're the only one doing all the adjustments, you're not being loved, you're being used. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. If you're the only one making sacrifices, you're being used. If you're the only one providing money and putting money into the pot, in your household, you're being used. Lot represents someone you have affection for that you are not responsible for. Even if you feel responsible for it, that you need to make adjustments for it. Now that's not saying a husband and a wife. Because the Bible says if you if you do not provide for your house, you are worse than an infidel. Very clear. But Lot represents someone we have unintentionally and unconsciously enabled. Our enablement has created entitlement, and now their entitlement is now giving us a headache. In other words, you just built a culture that is now costing you problems. We thought we were helping, but we were enabling. We had the right motives, but the wrong motion. And our enablement created an entitlement in them. And now their entitlement is giving us a headache. It's causing us some problems. It's bringing on some schism. Now, what this text does in Genesis is something extremely unique. It gives us insight into Abram's life before his name was changed. Because how many know Abram turned into Abraham? Abraham means father of nations. He wasn't Abraham. He was initially Abram. So in this passage, he's not yet Abraham. He's Abram. And I want to say something very important for us. Because how you handle Lot determines whether or not you stay Abram or become Abraham. I broke the mic. I wanted to drop it so bad. How you handle Lot determines whether or not you stay Abraham or become Abram or become Abraham. See, Abraham represents the potential who he was supposed to be. The potential of what he was supposed to be called and his purpose in life. It's reaching the pinnacle of what God desires for your life. That's Abraham. But when you're constantly and chronically responsible for someone else's responsibility, it impacts our ability to be responsible for the things and the people that we're responsible for and who God calls us to be responsible. And what God is going to require for you, it requires both hands. 
So with one hand, you might have to let go and let God. You might have to let go and you might have to trust God. Is it easy? No. It's hard, don't you? But in order to seek the face of God, sometimes you have to leave ones that you love behind. Jesus didn't have one hand nailed to the cross yet, too. Because you got your hands full with you. You can't do two people. You can only do your responsibility. For you, God, and family. So it becomes difficult to accomplish certain assignments when we don't make the adjustments that we need with them. Lot. And with that relationship. Listen to me, sometimes we're acting out of affection. And we assume that we're acting out of love. How do you know the distinction? Affection always says yes, but love sometimes says no. I remember an old song, if you love somebody, set them free. I didn't realize it would be so prophetic. But that's what the scripture right here is talking about. Sometimes love has to say no. And so affection can drive our actions and we can act in ways that are unhealthy. We can start to become in, we can start to become obsessed with certain things that we believe that we need in our lives. And this is what Abram did. Because if you're familiar with this, in Genesis chapter 12, Abram received the revelatory word from God. Abram was told by God, I want you to leave this place. I want you to leave your father's house and your people. And I want you to go to a place that I have prepared for you. In other words, that required separation from the familiar to go to that which is unfamiliar for God. Get out of your country and your kindred to a land that I'm going to show you. You might have to get out because people are constantly reminding you of who you were. People are constantly reminding you of the failures that you've had in the past. People are constantly reminding you of, of your limitations. They're putting a lid over your head where you cannot get any higher than here when God is calling you up here. God is saying, come up here. For Abraham, his success is going to require some separation. Because there are some people that are never going to let you be Abraham. And each and every one of us have an Abraham that we're called. They like Abram. You ever know people like that? Oh, I like when you were drunk. I like when you were a bumbling idiot. I like when you were fat. I like when you were hopeless. I like when you were strung out on drugs and didn't know where you were going. I like when you acted the fool. They like you stuck. They like life with Abram. They love Abram, though Abram is inferior version of you. They love Abram and you don't. They love the person that you hate and the person that you wish you were desperately out of. And they're constantly reminding you of that. You know, there's some people that love a version that you know. And some people love you when you didn't like yourself too much. So as we look in Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abram, what I need and want you to do in and through you requires me separating you from previous influences. 
I don't want you to be around those people with a poor attitude. I don't want you to be around people who have poor mentality. I don't want you to, 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 to be around those people that are like scavengers. I need to get you into a place where you be in, where your mindset and your thoughts are different. I need you to step up. See, he's not saying where you came from was inferior. Because there was a ministry for that. But what he's saying, what he's saying is, what I want to do in your life requires you to get away from those people. You can't be fighting to get clean from drugs and hang out in Cole Park. I'm sorry. Don't tell me I'm fighting through alcoholism when you're sitting down in the bar day after day. Certain things you have to step away from. Certain things you have to walk away from. And that's what we are over here today. The purpose of Abram's separation from Lot is because there was too much growth. And as long as Abram stood with Lot, the growth will be stopped. Remember what we talked about? You can go and live over here as a standard, up here or over here. You need to choose. What's your standard going to be? Are you going to be down here? Are you going to be in a, in, a, in a place where you're just, just going, shortened through life? No victory? No joy? No hope? That's calling you higher. That's what he's calling you today. To come up higher. That wasn't going to happen without the separation. He says this. In verse 5 to 7, it says, Now Lot went with Abraham and had flocks, herds, and tents. And the land could not sustain them while they were dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot. Now, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Why would God put that in there? Because how you walk is a testimony to people. The lost are always looking at you. Lost people are looking for a reason for life because they're down here. And they know it. They want to have life and life abundantly. They want to have love. They want to have freedom. But they're down here and they're caught. They're in prison. They can go no further than the bars that they put on their own parameters of their lives. Showing constraint and separation. For the name of God's sake from time to time is what's necessary to be a testimony. Because you're valuing God greater than you're valuing your own desire. What you've become accustomed to. You'll become a testimony. In order for them to get what they needed to, they also had to defeat the Canaanites and the Parasites. They also represent the spirit of the land that has to overcome. And it can't be overcome if there's violence, if you're fighting within yourselves. Hallelujah. Then Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we're brothers. They recognize the relationship. It said, is not the whole land before you. 
me separate me. If I go to the left, you go to the right. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw Sodom. And went after Sodom because Sodom went good. See, Abram learned his lessons. Lot didn't. Lot didn't. The amazing thing about that is after this happened, after the separation happened, he said this, watch this. He went, Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came about when he came to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, he, oh, he had a prop, you're a beautiful woman, and he had to go through a hardship to get to where he was going. But you know what happened a lot? Abram went through his hardship, but Lot pitched his tent outside of Sodom. See, sometimes we like to get close to things that we shouldn't be near. He can say, well, I'm not in Sodom. How close can I get to certain things before I fall into it? Oh, I didn't do anything. But I was in the back of a steaming car with somebody who looked good from the opposite sex. I didn't do anything. Yet. You see, there's the problem, there's the issue. Many times we go and we say, we, we separate, and now all of a sudden we find ourselves in a place where we get too close to things we shouldn't be too close to. And the amazing thing is, look at what happened afterwards. Abram There was a battle and a fight. Five kings against four kings. And Lot was taken into captivity and Abram heard about it. And Abram went and got three, he stopped whatever it was that he was doing taking care of his family, growing his livestock and everything else that was happening. And he left that, he went, got 318 men who were able to fight, who were able to battle. And after he did that, he had to go in and battle and defeat nine kings because it was five against four. And Lot was caught in the middle. Separation is important from time to time, and listen to me. This is the reason why. Because Lot got delivered, and then they came back, and they met this unique man named Melchizedek, and he gave him a tithe, and said, thank you for giving us the victory, but I needed the victory because of Lot, not because of myself, because of somebody who I was responsible for. I was brought back to that place. I was brought to a place of potential peril because I had to take care of somebody who I was responsible for. You want to know the head, the, the head scratcher? After Abram rescued Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah, do you know what Lot did? Lot went right back into Sodom and Gomorrah. He went right back into the place that he got to be delivered from. And the reason why is because he was enabled by Abram. Because he knows if he gets into trouble, Abram's going to come out and get him out. Do you see that? Abram's going to get him out. Because he could get 318 men, but Abram has nobody to talk to. Because Lot's out for himself. So some of the some of the relationships, some of the things that we are engaged in, that we are that we are in, needs to be severed. Because if you don't look out for your spirit, if you don't look out for the walk you have in your life, guess what's going to happen? You have no one to call. Because that other person can always call you because you're faithful and you're good and you're on top of your game. 
But who do you have to call when you have a need? That's why we need to get closer to Jesus. And our relationships right now, we need to keep our circle small. We need to allow things to settle and find out God's will and God's purpose for our lives. Every last one of us. Whether you're here, whether you're in North Carolina, whether you're in Florida, whether you're in South Carolina, whether you're in Guyana, wherever you are, we love you, Bueno. Whether you're in Pennsylvania and you're watching, our relationships are paramount. And they can take us to a higher, to a low. Let's pray. Father, we need you. We need discernment in how to go forward and how to move forward. Because some of the relationships are head games. Some of the relationships are giving us a headache. Some of the things that we do, Lord God, help us in how we relate to other people. Because we don't want to be the people that go in and are enabling others. We want to be the people who help. We want, to be, we want to be the salt and the light of the earth. We want to be a blessing to those around about us. And we carefully give you the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Coffee and junk food in the back. I see junk food. Wait, hold healthy on a second. Oh, and healthy fellowship. Okay. Oh, yeah. Louise brought some fruit, too. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, he always, he always brings fruit. Love you guys.